the implications of today's conversation, I think, uh, will have an immediate effect on what you're doing creatively and what you're doing with your business, especially as it relates to negotiating your life. And uh, today, uh, the guest we have on is um, a dear friend of mine. His name is Dan Dakini, and I'll bring him on in just a second. But uh, as not to embarrass him, I want to say a couple nice things uh, without him being on the screen. Uh, Dan has uh, is someone I met about five years ago. Um, had immediate impact on my own life uh, personally. Opened up significant things that I just that were right in front of me that I just couldn't see. And uh, he helped me see those things in such a way that I got. Uh, an immediate uh, return on my own life's investment in new ways. Um, and you're going to have that opportunity to, to get to know him a little bit today as well. And in a very short period of time, just 30, 40 minutes, we're going to cover significant distinctions that I think will offer you an opportunity to reframe how you are going about all of your daily negotiations. Now, uh, again, a little background. Dan has. Um, uh, been involved uh, as the founder of an organization called CROI or Culture ROI. You can check them out at cultureroi.com, uh, as well as a faith-based organization called ACCD, which is the Association for Christian Character Development. Uh, and in both contexts, he just helps people get clear on where they're at, clear on where they're going. And I think you'll notice as we start talking, some of the things that you guys have benefited from me over the past. Uh, just so you know, I stole most of that stuff from Dan and and uh, his his uh, colleagues and. And call, I would call Dan a colleague now. We've become very close friends, and I hope you will enjoy the conversation as well uh, and become friends with Dan. So without further ado, uh, Dan Dakini, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. Uh, we are awkwardly close. We're going to plug in, and I'll give you this thing, and uh, we'll be attached at the, at the uh, white hip here. Um, but uh, Dan, before we're getting, we get started, um, first off, thanks for being here. It's My pleasure. A, it's a treat to have you here. Um, the folks that are watching uh, are often, they're, they're small business owners, they're people who are often, a lot of them are creatives, uh, they're companies of one, two, or three, and the idea of negotiation, um, at least what as someone in that exact position of a small business owner in those kind of categories, when I think of negotiation, I don't think of me, I always think of like the companies you work with, like the Disneys and the ESPNs and, and the Microsofts. and those people get to go negotiate, and yet for me, um, I just feel like I'm just trying to stay afloat. So if you're talking to that guy, and they're saying, what in the world does negotiation have to do with me and my business? Could you kind of on a very practical level spell that out for the folks who are listening? Sure. <clears throat> well, it's it's pretty common. I do these, I've done these trainings for the last uh, 14 years around the country diff with with everybody. I mean, from executive to the, the housewife or the I like to say the home engineer right and uh, which it is I very much appreciate having me being having my mother and others like that uh -huh. in my life but they, they're great negotiators anyway um, when when I asked what is provo provoked when you talk about negotiation that's usually what comes up a transaction that usually carries out between uh, two large concerns over millions of dollars in some secret room, you know, and, and they come out and oh, we have a pope, or we, you know, we have right. we have a big deal. Right. And uh, I don't think people really take the time or have really heard about you know just the science of negotiation. It's quite a field. In fact, um, I've heard it said that conflict is a growth industry, hmm. and that negotiating conflict is a growth industry. Now, most people I know don't like conflict, and maybe that's why they don't like to negotiate. Yeah, because most people's understanding of negotiation is boiled down to a very small part of a negotiation, and is uh, it's it's called bargaining over positions. Okay. And um, that's so, usually what people think about. So when you say the difference between negotiation and bargaining over position in a small business context, what would be an, a practical example of what that looks like? Well, I mean, just like you're going to buy some office furniture for your your office, and you go down instead of going down and buying new furniture, you're going to go down and buy some used furniture. At a local, um, like an auction, or an auction, right, or you know, if somebody's going out of business. You're going to go in and, and talk to them, or they're changing equipment, and you go in and you say, "Yeah, I like that desk." They say, "Well, that, yes, sir, that desk is top line." Blah blah blah, and this positioning process starts going in, hmm. and there's only two positions that get, can be taken, or approaches in this approach, and that's the hard position and the soft position. The good cop, bad cop kind of approach. Well, yeah, the hard position is there to win. The soft position is there to preserve the relationship. Got it. All right. Got it. All right. Something. So yeah. So the hard position is going to look to win whatever they can get, 
and they're going to position themselves uh, and they usually win because they can hold the ambiguity and the tension longer and the soft and they're usually looking how they can win while the soft position is looking for how they can hold the relationship and right. get something of what they want so get close but not offend my neighbor or my buddy or my colleague yes right. and, and so the it's a pretty common default that we use and that's what negotiation usually gets funneled down into when people talk they go, oh, you know I don't like negotiating or it's stressful because it gets reduced to that quite quickly because there's they, they haven't thought about a third game or or attempted to even change that game so if if bargaining for position the, the kind of situation you're describing was the default for most of us certainly would be for me it is for us like I, a, I'm buying a car right now and that, this is kind of my position I'm walking in I don't need to have this guy be my friend I'm looking to win and they're looking to win <coughs> and it seems like that's what we're doing as we're bargaining for position but if I'm it's not, if I'm smart, it sounds like I, there's other considerations that are on the table when it comes to negotiation that I just don't, I might, I might miss. So yes. what, what might some of those be? Well, it's if you take that context. The card example is a context where you could mistakenly say, or you could, and, and it actually works to say, well, I'm never going to see this guy again, so right. what the heck, and that might be a place to go right to bargaining. I don't recommend it, and it's interesting you brought it up because my brother was a car salesman for 20 years and made high, big six-figure incomes from doing it hmm. and the way he did that wasn't by picking people off the lot but by creating value with them when they came in understanding their interest hmm. uh, meeting those interests building a relationship that would be ongoing and in fact he sold one of the doobie brothers a car and hmm. and there and he sent the agent and the agent sent the rest of them and over the years he sold them many cars and sold other artist cars because of the word of mouth that got around about the value. Now that's so we've had a number of guests this year uh, on recently like I say this year because it's been fairly recent but uh, one guy that immediately pops to mind someone that I know you know as well um, is uh, Seth Godin and yeah. um, and also Guy Kawasaki and in both cases I asked them uh, <coughs> what would you say to a photographer for example a, a creative professional who is interested in um, not only surviving in a tough economic time, but thriving and looking ahead beyond this season that we're all in. And they both said in different kind of language, well, you got to start looking at what you're doing from the perspective of the people who are buying, not just the perspective that you're in. And it sounds like you're alluding to that a little bit here. Exactly. I, um, the idea is to think about it this way. There's only two interests in any negotiation. There's a, there's a, material interest or a let's say a substance interest mm -hmm. and then there's a always a relational interest and so if you can separate those two then you can actually create some dis some power and some value not only for yourself but for the other person hmm. so um, it, 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 and really if you think about it what you want they have what they want you have so you have as long as the negotiation as long as you recognize that you're better off together than you are apart you have the basis for a value-added transaction. Hmm. And unfortunately, what happens oftentimes is by this position bargaining, it produces unwise uh, agreements. It actually is, in effect, inefficient because hmm. it, it often takes more time and effort to get to the end of it. Hmm. And then at the end, it, it, it decreases the relational uh, credibility or currency. Hmm. And so therefore... It decreases trust, trust erodes. Trust erodes, and so you don't get the value of of the of the momentum that could possibly come out of a relationship. Because, quite frankly, nobody knows when we're going to meet again, or if we meet again, in what context. Mm. And if I've got good relational rapport with you, that could pay off in the future and in some other context. Now, this is this is fascinating to me on a lot of lev levels. But um, before we even get into, I want to go deeper with what you're describing. But for a lot of folks, I, I'm guessing who are listening, and tell me, by the way, if, if this is the case for you, either in the chat room, I'd encourage you to ask the question button and uh, um, go ahead and ask it so we can pull it on screen. Uh, what ever happens every week, just so you guys know, is people listen, they engage, they listen, and then they all ask questions at the end. And the folks who ask questions at the beginning are, are all the ones who really benefit. So my encouragement for you guys is to take advantage of that and jump in. Uh, but again, for a lot of folks, they're, they're not even framing what, where the negotiation possibilities are. Mm -hmm. So what are some examples in everyday small business life that could be negotiated that people either crumble and don't negotiate or they, they don't enter into this? I love how you put that where I have something they want and they have something I want. Like I think of every, every negotiation with a client. Last night I had a client meeting and um, 
uh, I'll just be candid with the situation. So it's a client that I've worked with for a ton of time, ton, years, uh, photographed her family. Uh, it was the one year anniversary of her daughter's birth, did this great photo session, did the sales meeting in their home. And uh, they're trying to buy a home right now. They came up in the conversation as we were going through it. And I had this sense internally of like, I need to give these guys a discount. They've been incredible customers to me. It wasn't needed. They didn't, I could have just charged retail. Mm -hmm. But I had this internal guttural sense of like, this would be exceedingly valuable for them, especially because they really loved the photographs and they weren't asking for the discount. Mm. Now, that might have been foolish. I don't know. But there was a sense in which I was going in with the sense of it isn't just about... How do I win? could happen with them? And because you don't know who they're going to refer you to. Refer or even shoot your sales or whatever. So that intuition would be a point of exploration. Hmm. Uh, it may not necessarily be something. There's a number of ways. A position would be to offer them, uh, a, you know, some incentive. Mm -hmm. But there may be. Th well, they were actually already going to buy. Yeah, that, so they, but I, mean, I, was, I was clear as they were going through the process of them viewing the images, they wanted them. They yeah. were, and they wanted them in a certain format that was going to be expensive. But I was also thoughtful too. That wasn't the whole. It wasn't just them wanting that. They wanted a bigger deal. Like they wanted. I got the impression they wanted a lifelong and continue to want a lifelong photographer in me. Right. So there's so there's a number of ways to think about it. The, the position is what you offer or how the interest is being met. Got it. So if the interest is a lifelong that they and they are looking to hmm. because it's tough times mm -hmm. or that they're they want to make their budget you know they want to be efficient with their budget there's a number of ways to think about meeting it one of is an, is an incentive another one is bartering hmm. maybe there's a trade that could be valuable to both and, and deepen the relationship at hmm. the same time so to begin to list all the different things that i have that they might want or they have that i might want and get creative in how that transaction can come together yeah, is part of the game. So, well, part of the, a big part of the game is in order. It first is there's kind of three steps I think about. I, I first I want to analyze what what the deal is. What is the merit of it? What makes up this the pie that we're working for? Hmm. The pie is the combination of interests mm -hmm. that come together at the table. Some are known, mm -hmm. some are even unknown. Interests that match up and hmm. right. The second thing is I want to, as I start to analyze that before I even talk with you, whether it's a 15-minute session before, or, you know, I spend a day before. It's depending on the context of the negotiation. I want to, after I analyze it, I want to, I want to plan how I might engage this conversation to find out more about what is not clear for me to test what I think is clear about the interest at the table. Okay, so let me repeat back what I'm hearing you say. So the first thing is, is it sounds like both those steps are about getting clear. Yeah, absolutely. And, and getting clear before I engage in a negotiation. Yes. So it sounds like I would be listening more than I would be talking. I'd be listening. I, I, there's a number of things. So in the planning, so in, in the analyzing and the planning stages, before I get to discussion, I'm employing, there's four basic distinctions I'm thinking about. I'm taking notes. Real simple. One. <laughs> okay. One, I want to separate, I want to distinguish who the people are at the table from the substantive issues of the negotiation. Got it. So who the people are, there's people that are visible at the table, and then there's people that are invisible at the hmm. table. So, so are these like stakeholders? Yeah, stakeholders, people that are going to be influenced. So for instance, with your client, they're at the table. But you know, also at the table are their relatives that are going to be sharing these pictures and these memories. Right. Uh, their friends, and and they're all going to be impacted somehow by this mm. interaction, both by the product itself mm. and by the nature of the relationship they share with you. It's funny you say that because this client in particular is the sister of a wedding client that I photographed, and who's now become a, a pr kind of a staple uh, portrait client, and and you're right that they represent. A group of people in a particular geography and a particular culture of people that, that when you're in that sub subgroup you have a lot of like if i were to if i were to anything were to break down with her or her sister i would years of business yeah uh but i'm not thinking in that those categories i'm actually trying to think like how could i fortify a position and get even deeper entrenched yeah. in the relationships well sure the, the, that's where you make the differences in the relationship and most people tend to forget that all, almost 90% of the, probably more, 90% or more of the, our negotiations happen in, in a context of a relationship that's already in process or you've been yeah. in it for years. 
Yeah. And that's that's part of this of changing the game from a positional bargaining. That's why people will say, I don't want to be in business with family or friends, because the way that they because there's a lot of negotiating. I mean, a yeah. simple a simple way to by the way to help the, you guys uh, connect with what I mean by negotiation or negotiating. It's a, it just means any communication that's designed to influence or persuade somebody. Well, that would cover or a lot anybody. of ground. Yes. So there's a lot of negotiating going on. I think a lot about my kids. I remember when my kids were growing up, that was a lot of negotiating. That's painful when you say that, because I'm negotiating <laughs> constantly. My son is a master negotiator. That's uh, what is he, 13? 11. Oh. And, and he, he works me like yesterday's news. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. But I, he treats everything as a negotiation. Yes. And now sometimes it's pretty irritating when it's my son coming in my direction. Is there a way to kind of de-irritate a negotiation? Well, I, you know, I, I have a young... And my son's 28 now, but right. I, of course he's the same. You've met him. He's I did. I have. He's a lot of fun, <laughs> and he's a negotiator. But they all are. Huh. Every, everybody's a negotiator. Whenever we have something, we are looking to influence or persuade people about mm. to to either fulfill uh, a substantive issue or a relational issue. We're in a negotiation, and though they be unique and multiple, mo you know, uh, varied, the principles apply, and that's why our tr you know what we do is pretty unique because mm -hmm. we're not going after, I've done every negotiation workshop I could think of, mm -hmm. and we're not after teaching uh, uh, necessarily strategies and practices and the principles that are like gravity in every negotiation, mm -hmm. regardless of the content or, or context. Mm -hmm. It's funny, what's flashing to mind for me is I, I had an employee a couple of years ago, some of you guys remember Lindy Galloway. Uh, Lindy was a, a, a client of mine. I, sh I photographed her wedding, and she was fantastic to work with, and I ended up hiring her for, for a little while. And um, and I remember we, we were shopping for a studio and doing a bunch of different things, and she was so quick in her capacity to negotiate. And she would talk about how in her family unit she was famous. They'd go down to Mexico as a family, and how she would, as a little girl, would you know barter with people and come up with value. And she she even she said pretty candidly, I hope this is okay, Lindy, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> she said pretty candidly, like and sometimes it just gets silly how people just cave like and she has to be compassionate for some of these folks because she's 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 like a master negotiator mm -hmm. and she knows she can get kind of whatever she is but she doesn't that's not her goal her right. goal is to get these tr real win-wins where they actually have a value they're not walking away resentful or frustrated or whatever later but i'm guessing for the folks who are listening if they want to seriously get good, good at negotiating this could create remarkable value in their life, personally, professionally, if indeed everywhere they want influence or want to persuade, even for good, or you know, and especially in light of other people wanting to influence or persuade, not necessarily for good. If they don't get good at negotiating, they, they're, they're going to lose a lot. Yeah, and most people are good at negotiating, except it de they they just don't get the the skills on the ground hmm. because of their attitude toward it. And if I look at negotiating as a manipulative process where I take a position and have to posture and all the games that go involved in that right. to get what I want, I dread that process. Mm. It's one of the reasons why I began to research it because I really just didn't want to have that kind of interaction with my wife, with my children, mm. or the people I worked with. I wanted to find ways to create agreement and, if you will, uh, without giving in mm -hmm. and deepen the relationship at the same time. So three basic distinctions I look for is that tells me whether this was a good negotiation, a valuable negotiation. Mm -hmm. One, if we establish, uh, you know, wise agreements. Mm -hmm. Wise agreements mean that they they meet the legitimate interests as much as possible of all the parties in, in play. Mm -hmm. Two, it's an efficient agreement. In other words, um, that the the relationship is, that, that people are, are actually uh, able to carry out what they want to do without a lot of pain and resistance. And number three, to improve or at least not hurt the relationship mm -hmm. so, so that we're building on it. You know, studies from Harvard show that, um, it, that it usually takes eight transactions or negotiations before the greatest opportunities emerge mm -hmm. in a business relationship, whether it's a small business relationship or a large business relationship, it's usually seven to eight transactions before the major opportunities. So let's say you and I, we, we've done business for five years. Mm -hmm. We've been friends and done business. And over the five, five years, we didn't just get start out doing some of the things we're doing. As we gained trust and 
and a, a, sense, a sense of understanding of each right. other's worlds and our relationship and what could be accomplished. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing things that are much more uh, larger, mm -hmm. have bigger possibility in right. them because there's a lot more trust between us. And this is so powerful. I immediately what's flashing to mind is all of my best vendor relationships, for example. And uh, Mike Hanline is a friend of mine. He, he runs this company called White House Custom Color. It's amazing. One of the best labs in the planet. Yeah, man. And, and uh, I remember when we first got into conversation, uh, we were kind of dancing and courting or whatever, and I got all excited. I wanted to do something. We can always uh, saddle up the horses to the wagon, but I have no interest in driving off in a Ferrari. <laughs> and, and, and and I, I thought... I, I, I really reflected on that for a lot of years, for two, three years now, and I've been amazed at how...